Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. It is very hot in this tent, so hopefully, we can stick on the interview. Um, I'm actually going to do this a little bit unconventionally because normally the speakers will come up here and introduce themselves. But I want to get a, I want to get you guys to get an idea in your head here first. Um, I'm just kind of curious, and I, I'll come back to you after the introductions. What is the one thing about the movement that is preventing us from moving forward? Because we're sitting here, I mean, Porkfest is growing, the movement's growing, but our legitimacy is actually seems to be going down, at least what I see. So I want you guys out there to think about that here for a second. I'm going to actually let Taryn introduce himself. Well, I'm not exactly sure where we're going with this, but what I'm trying to, my understanding is that Corey wants to put in some uh, business principles almost to market and to bring in people that, uh, to, to get the message better in a business sense. And they brought me on because at one time I was actually pretty good at business. Um, I don't talk about it much, but some of you guys might know that um, I was pretty much retired by 30. I was already a millionaire at 30. And uh, I had started out uh, about a two to three year working span. I did that as, as a chiropractor. And then uh, I also later on lost it all. So I know what to do and what not to do to make money. And Corey wanted to, uh, to talk about the money aspects and how to basically juxtapose that to running a successful business into how to um, use the same principles to turn people over to liberty. So I'm going to share with you some marketing tips and how you can just bend those a little bit to apply them to winning friends, I guess, and influencing people in the libertarian movement. I hate to steal that. I came up with that, by the way. Did you know that? That was my book. Napoleon totally took that. <laughs> Didn't even know about it. I'm going to pass you over to Brian Hagen, who is quite the orator and has been able to bring in people with a different kind of message. And he is excellent at bringing in and influencing people to open up and be friendly in what they do with liberty. And I think that's going to be a big theme here is we are too angry. <laughs> so we need to cool it off, be friendly, and have fun. And you'll find out if you can do that, it's very, very good for your pocketbook or your message. The biggest thing I can say to the liberty movement on a whole is get a freaking sense of humor. Don't take yourself so seriously. You know, you walk around and you try to say hi to somebody, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, but it was it Rothbard or Hayek? And there's always room and place for those conversations, but not every second. And then if you go against that grain, suddenly, boom, you know, oh, you're, you're a pariah of some kind. My name is Brian Hague, and I have been successful in spreading that message of liberty. I have a catchphrase. I'm the voice of the Liberty Beat, uh, which you can catch on LRN.FM. We're expanding. John Bush gave the uh, announcement a little while ago in the Agorist pitch. I'll say it right now. We haven't signed the contract. Keep it under your hats, but we're going to the GCN radio network, which is going to be huge and going to be tremendous, being like a million people every week. And the way I always close the Liberty Beat, unless I run out of time, is always spread liberty with a smile. And I believe that. I've been a long-time radio broadcaster. I've won so many awards, I don't even know where they're all at anymore. Uh, I was a member of an award-winning uh, morning show team for 15 years. Certainly was not a libertarian-themed show, but I brought the messages of liberty into it in a funny manner that everyone could relate to. Had, you know, the good argument on, stay on, on, on air between my boss and I, he'd take the other side. And it was a fantastic way to spread that. Uh, I'm at a different radio station now, news director, six radio stations covering Kansas and portions of Nebraska. And one of my co-workers is a very hardcore Democrat. And she said to me, upon talking to me like three weeks after I worked in this building, she goes, you're not like any other libertarian I've ever met. You're actually kind of fun. You're actually not pushy. You're not forceful. So now it's almost daily when the bosses go away, she comes into my office and we have a chat that ends in a discussion of liberty. And I think we're really going to get into that today about keep a sense of humor. Corey. 
Thank you, guys. That's why I wanted to have you on, because they're both brilliant. And, of course, they have the Liberty Cats podcast, which they say is the best on the Internet. But Most important show on air. I'd have to disagree. <laughs> so, um, Brian actually touched on something I wanted to touch on real quick, which is we see ourselves, even you apolitical, I'm not going to vote types, actually, the people out there, when you start talking to them about the ideas of liberty, see this as a political movement. And my theory and we're going to talk about this, this should be a social movement. We need to move into the age of lifestyle libertarianism, which is be successful in your own personal life, learn how to deal with people and how power works, and learn how to influence. Um, you got to be self-sufficient. you got to figure out ways to live your life in a way that you don't look like a bum off the street. Uh, my name is Corey Moore. I am the host of The Corey Moore Show. And uh, I've had some various businesses um, somewhat successful throughout uh, the few years I've been involved. I ran the second iteration of Ron Paul Radio. Um, I've vended here before. Nothing really too big. I had a, actually a somewhat successful freelance uh, web design company, but I just kind of was kind of sick of dealing with uh, customers for a while, so I went into it a little bit more professionally. But, you know, I've spent my past year really trying to learn uh, from people who are successful and I thought I'd come here and share it with you guys with the two of the guys that I know are fairly successful um, I did come into the movement via Ron Paul and uh, All Expo doesn't advocate political action and neither do I but I, I bring up this fact that I came into Ron Paul Because there was a lot of influence in this campaign. It brought a lot of people in it was probably one of the most amazing ways to bring market anarchists into a market anarchist movement, but it never went anywhere because we look around us right now and I'd say probably, would I be right saying about 70% of the people here are at poverty or below? I think that's probably a good guess. So I'm really hoping that we can help people out and try to, uh, you know, teach how to maybe be a more better professional. We, I mean, we have people here who advocate for self-sufficiency, uh, the farming and all that, and that's great, but that's not the lifestyle for everyone. Some people like to sit around in the air-conditioned room and watch Netflix. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Taryn here. I'll let him cover the money part because, again, Millionaire by 30, amazing. Well, all right, here's the big thing people don't get, and this can transcend business and it can transcend a liberty message or basically anything in your life and if you can hello hey hey <laughs> that's mr porky pole the original hey. Hey, Evan, inaugural. <laughs> <laughs> all right um the big message here and this is you really got to open your ears and listen to this if you do what i tell you to do you'll be successful no matter trying to convince someone that you're form of liberty or your flavor of liberty is the best or trying to get been someone to buy something from you that you've made here's the secret you have to make them want it and what I mean by that is do you base when I'm talking to someone on liberty do they make the decision to accept what I'm saying on logic or emotion which is more powerful Emotion. We make our decisions on emotion. So if you come into my office and you have some problem you want me to work with you on, and I say, well, you've been sick a long time, it's going to take six months to treat you, I don't take insurance, it's going to cost $10,000. Now, people will be like, holy cow, I don't have $10,000, I'm poor, I'm broke. If I convince you that you really, really want this and you need this, <laughs> you'll find that money. And people, this is what they don't get. Even the brokest person, you go and look at someone on welfare, homeless, whatever, they've got $200 tennis shoes. They found the money to get what they wanted to get because they wanted to get it and it was a complete emotional buy. When I'm asking someone for $10,000 for a care plan or something, they will go ask their friends, their church, their relatives, whatever. They'll borrow the money because it's something they really want to do. If you've been miserable and oh, I hate your body or in pain or whatever, and it, I'm offering you a solution, you will buy it from me. It's based on emotion. You can use the same idea in liberty. If I sit here and try to argue with you logically, you're not going to get anywhere. 
you're going to just listen to me and we're going to listen to each other and just argue and argue and argue. But if I paint the, my flavor of liberty as this wonderful, beautiful thing that I love and that I want and I live my life by and it's like, it's done all these great things for me, you're going to want what I have. So that's the big secret is you need to just shine the light on your flavor and have them want it instead of telling them they want it. Do you understand the difference? It's an emotional choice. You want to use emotion to drive that. If you get that one idea and you understand that, man, you can open so many doors. Because you listen to what a person wants and you paint an emotional picture back of what they want and you have the answer. It doesn't really matter what it is. Yeah, question? Well, it seems like, uh, like so two years ago was my version, if you will. Um, and I was first so angry, you know, then I had to learn how to just be like, okay, cool, it's like you're one of the 2% of people that might get it. Um, if you come across as, you know, just ranting about everything at the same time, then you're never going to get anywhere. You have to, you have to know the person well enough to, like, so I work at financial planning, and part of that process is putting the person at ease that you're not a threat to them. Well, I mean that you're not a, 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 a piranha just trying to get a commission. That's the difference. It's, it's just like dating. Yes. And this is something most libertarian men really need help with. There was a panel earlier about that, I think. The creepitarian thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you don't act like you want it, and you honestly don't believe or care what other people think and you do what you want. That's attractive. So if you come to me and I say, you know, I'm doing this lifestyle, uh, in my own personal wrestling, I've always been kind of overweight on and off, and I, I work with thyroid issues, so I've lost like 30, 40 pounds doing some thyroid stuff, and people around me see that. I don't beat them over the head with it. They come to me and ask me, why? What are you doing? And I'm like, man, it's awesome. I feel 10 years younger. Um, my body's starting to recover back to what it was like when I was a kid. You know, these things are, my energy's ridiculous. And they want what I have. I'm not beating them over the head or selling it to them. They come to me. That's a big difference because it takes them off guard. So the way you would work with financial planning is you need to find out what's important to them and then talk about how you have something similar and how it's made your life so much better. So, oh, really, I know what you... It's tackling the fear. You know, um, it's not fear. You need to create desire and want. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Look, that will overwhelm fear. But there isn't... But everyone has a, a sense of fear. There, there is fear, but, like but desires are more powerful in fear than most people. Absolutely. Talk to women. Yeah. That, that, like, that's, you know, not that... Just a quick, quick example. This is, again, dating here, right? Go ahead. <laughs> you're, you're dating your client. You're, you're creating if you're desire. Dating, right. You date your boss. I think that's definitely true. Yeah. You want to stay, or you, you know, stay at a, your marginal utility, you stay below it. Anyway, um... Uh, we had a client who gave us a check to invest their money, and it was like maybe they were worth about ten million. They gave us five hundred thousand dollars to cure take it, and we said no. Give it a few more days and just think about it. So they're going home instead of thinking, "What did I just give my money to?" They're going home and thinking, "Can I trust this person?" And the and the answer right. is, You've, yes, it came back later with not just five hundred thousand dollars, ten million dollars. It's it's how con men do it. Right. It's the confidence. You turn down the beginning money Persuasion. and then they, they come yeah. with the real once they feel comfortable. Yeah. Exact same thing with dating, it's the exact same thing with convincing someone that your libertarian position's right. You understand it's all the same cycle, it's the same emotions, it's the same thing. You're selling liberty. Right. So if you get that and understand how to transpose that, he's talking about how he did a takeaway close. No, I really don't want your money. If you're dating, no, I really don't want to date. You know, I'm not ready for it. Or, or even the, well, your libertarian positions, you know, I get it. But this side really works for me. It's made me happy. And this is what it's done. You know, I used to be this person that lived in fear and was worried the dollar's going to collapse. and was going to worry that, you know, all hell's going to break loose and I'm going to be eating my dog. But this solution, XYZ, has really eased my fear and calm and I can go to sleep now and not keep up at night and worry about that. Do you ever have problems where you just brain won't shut the hell up? You know, and it's this live in this world of fear. If you want out of that fear, man, you gotta check out what I read here. 
blah, blah, blah. You want to get rid of that, you know, you listen and you present, you steer it where you want it to go, but you do it with emotion. Stop using logic, damn it. Here, Brian has emotion. <laughs> I'm all emotion, actually. Yeah, come on in. Welcome, welcome aboard. If you're listening to this, you better drop a dollar in that bucket because it's bad karma not to. Exactly. <laughs> Keep these great events happening. Corey, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, you know, I think Taryn actually makes a really good point. And this is something I see a lot. You know, we all go through this. When you become a fresh libertarian, you're so excited. Like, oh my God, this is the answer? It's like a religion, right? You're like, I got to tell everyone. You go tell your mom, hey, mom, guess what I found out? Yeah, if you just, nobody use violence against each other and everyone's really kind to each other, then the whole world is going to be fantastic. And people are looking at you like you've got, like, some sort of growth coming out of your head. Um, so you do have to sell, and that's really the most essential uh, skill that I think you could have in life in general. You have to be able to talk to people and use emotion. Um, now, I found that if, with the logic thing, I found if you use the logic thing, tactically can work. It depends on the type of person you're talking to. But you have to pique their interest. I, I forget, there is actually a name for that, um, the Kahneman use. Taryn, you seem to know a lot about Kahneman. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, yeah. Uh, you're talking about um, the mark? No, the mark's the guy you're usually roping someone. Roping? Yeah, the roper listens to what they're going to do, and then you, you make your pitch to what they're interested in. Yeah, you've got to find, look around them. I mean, it, like he said, it's like dating, it's like anything like that. You just have to find common ground somewhere. Um, with Liberty, it's really not that hard. You just start talking to them, hearing about their lives, uh, what they're, you know, what they do, and, you know, eventually they're going to come up and say some complaint, unless they're the, like, the nicest person in the world and they don't like to complain, they're going to complain about something. And I found that usually you could tie that back into, well, you know, maybe the government caused that. Yeah. You get that little seed in there. Um, and eventually, you know, don't try to push them really hard. Don't be hardcore about it. Uh, just really, the whole key to this is be friendly to people, make friendships, and uh, I see Taryn wants the mic again. Just, just one second. When you're, when you're talking with someone, you never want to tell them their idea sucks. Yeah. So you agree and then steer it where you want it to go. Yeah, that's a great idea. I know when I was looking for a solution to this, I was in the same boat, but I kind of found another less violent way to do it. Have you ever seen this or heard of that? You know, you steer it. Yeah, you want to steer it, exactly. And the other thing you don't want to do is if you don't want people to be argumentative with you, so even if you disagree and inside you're just like, God, you're such a statist, I hate you so much. Like, you know, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. I, I understand. That's, that's really frustrating. That's really frustrating. I understand that. And then maybe you can divert it somewhere else that you can be in agreement. You want them to say yes as much as possible. As soon as in their mind they think you're full of crap and they say no, they're not going to want anything to do with it. It's the guest train. Exactly. Right. Brian, do you have anything to say on this? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll keep going. Yeah, question. No, well, more comments. I think um, one of the things is that sometimes we are trying to convince the wrong people. There are those who are died in the world one decision or another, and there are the extremes, and we're not going to change their mind, just like they're not going to change our mind. But there's a vast majority of people that could call them fence sitters or, you know, in politics they call them the independent voter or whatever. And those are the people who really haven't committed one way or the other. And those yeah. are the people we need to look at and say, well, hey, you know, because they're not opposed to us right from the get-go. They just really haven't made a decision. She, she's nailed it. And this is huge in sales in, because you're selling liberty and you're selling your idea. Timing's huge. So if this person's all caught up over here and this is their happy land, you're not really going to make much influence. You're going to be much happier going for the low-hanging fruit where you don't have to push them far. Yeah, you just sit, and again, I should take that back. You're not pushing, you're seducing. You're bringing them over to your word by saying, look how good this answer is here. And they'll go, oh yeah, that is better. You're not shoving them, you're drawing them in. 
Understand? Pay attention to the way cats work. Your cat. Great. All right, nothing. All right. <laughs> no. Well, the fact of the matter is, just real quick, I, I, I want to build on that too. Going back to what I said at the beginning of the presentation about having that one coworker. Now, Taryn Nellett, she comes in, she's got all these ideas, and she, she presents them as fact. Now, I could sit there and start screaming, statist? You're such a statist, blah, blah, blah. I don't do that. I go, you know what, that's, that's true. I have a little bit of questions. Koch brothers, she's huge with hating the Koch brothers. and I, I don't know enough to really have an opinion, except what I do is I kind of twist that and tell her, well, they did start Reason Magazine. Have you ever read that? Well, yeah, I have. And then you take that idea and you take that conversation, you steer it away. From that preconceived notion before long you're engrossed in a whole different conversation and all of a sudden that person realizes oh, wait I hadn't thought of it that way this is a unique way of thinking about it you make them enjoy the conversation they're gonna walk away from that with new information and if you're really lucky they're gonna want to spread that down the road with someone else yeah I'd have to agree um, and I've I mean, of course, I don't really keep track of it. It's not that the number's very high, but I've convinced quite a few people of being libertarian, and I've never convinced someone of being a libertarian through logical reasons. It, I mean, I know we're just pounding this point again and again and again, but you have to be a person. Um, you, you cannot just be this Robotron that says, hey, go read Rothbard, go read this, go read that. If your argument is dependent on a book that somebody else wrote, then your argument sucks. Um, you might be able to you might be able to formulate your opinion based upon that, but you can't tell someone, oh yeah, go read Human Action. That's a, that's a fantastic book. I mean, not to mention that it was translated from German and is like this thick. Um, even even the small books, people go tell them to read the small books. Who reads? I mean, the statistic is, I think like 85% of college graduates, people who got four-year bachelor's degrees, do not read once they graduate college. 95% of high school graduates do not read one single book after they graduate high school. So telling them to go read a book is not going to convince them to do anything. Um, uh, what you could do, and we were talking to Davi Barker about this the other night, uh, who runs Bitcoins Not Bombs. Uh, he, he wrote a book, of course I said don't read a book, but he, read, he wrote a book about a zombie apocalypse situation. Uh, people do read fiction books and they do love zombies. And I, he did something which I, I'm calling culture freaking, and I'm pretty sure the term's been around for a while, which is injecting liberty into fictional works. And actually, Terrence is like really good at that. Terrence published a couple books in that way. And uh, you have to, you, we have this quote unquote alternative media. Uh, you know, we have our libertarian shows. We got LRN.FM. We got our, we got the Liberty Bee. We've got Liberty this, Liberty that, Liberty. It, nobody cares. If, if it's all about stuff that the movement cares about, who are you reaching on the outside? What we really need is to get Duck Stanhope's out there. We really need to get people out there who are mainstream, but their ideas are liberty minded. Once you can influence people in that way, that's when we've made it. It is not this insular. I'm going to say it, bullshit. It's not insular bullshit. We really need to get out there and start producing media that is that the mainstream can eat up. Question. Uh, you better be tipping. I'm sorry. Let's return questions. Throw another dollar. Yeah, well, I, I've already put five in. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, movies like, or the show like House of Cards, Orange yeah. is the New Black. I mean, to me, that's so awesome. Because it, its intent may not be the libertarian mindset, but it just... It's awesome portrayal of, you know, it, it's incredible. Because yeah, well, it's an emotional appeal. We were actually talking about that. Uh, Brian and I uh, hosted the Angel Clark show yesterday, and we were having a conversation with Ben Stone about that. And uh, who was the other one? It was Diana. Diana from uh, Freedom Fiends. And we were talking about, you know, libertarian themes in TV and movies and things like that. Uh, Gilligan's Island, if you ever see Ben Stone and have a conversation with him, ask about how Gilligan's Island is uh, was based on libertarian thought and uh, that that's really the key you have to show the real life from our perspective and the real the reality is I mean uh, John Stewart has that famous quote uh, reality has a liberal bent no reality has a libertarian bent um, if, if you present actual reality the power structures will come out and be so transparent it's disgusting the only reason people don't recognize it in their daily lives is they're so caught up in the minutia of it that they, their minds are blinded to it. But once you put it on the screen for their entertainment, they'll start understanding it really 
quickly. And I'm going to pass it over to Taryn to talk about a couple of his books and how he's, how he's done that. I was really amazed when we arrived uh, early in the week. I think we came on Sunday. I think it was the following Monday. I mean, I'm walking around with Taryn Lupo here, and people are coming up, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and they're, you know, giggling like little Japanese schoolgirls. Hey, 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 you're Taryn Lupo. I've read your books. And first of all, I'm thinking, what Corey said, people still read? <laughs> and then second of all, you read Taryn Lupo's books? But yeah, he's very well read. He's a best-selling author. And uh, how'd you make that happen, Taryn? The honesty is a lot of it was dumb luck and timing, in a sense, and that's the truth. I got in the ebook craze before it arrived, kind of, it just arrived at the right time, and one of my books got to the top 100, and I just rode that puppy out for all it was worth. So then that gave me the freedom to write a bunch of other books, and they're absolutely right, and I'm going to tie this all together. Understand that people need to feel good. Go back to the emotional thing we were talking about. If you can make people laugh with your liberty message, they subconsciously link that together. Liberty equals feeling good. You got to make them either enjoy it or give them something they want or need. And I, I keep going back to the, you know, seducing them into liberty and making them fall in love with liberty. Almost every person wants to make their own decisions in their life. This isn't a hard sell, but they don't see it that way. You know, you be like, yeah, I understand that you want to send your kid to you know, government school, I get that, and, and they, you want the same experience your kids had. But you know, you know there, there's the switch. But you know, <laughs> then, then you insert XYZ, you know, that I've met some great homeschooling kids, and man, they're smart, and they're happy, and well-adjusted. And I think if I were to do it again, I think I would have homeschool kids, or whatever your element is. You're not disagreeing. You're agreeing, oh yeah, yeah, I had a good time in my high school too. But man, I see these kids over here, and wow. So you never say no. You're never disagreeing. You just shift. And guys, you can, again, since most of these guys are so bad at dating girls here, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> it's the same thing. You never tell your woman no. You just shift. Um, they seem to know it. Women need to know it, like, naturally. I don't know where y'all learn it, but you're, like, ingrained with it. That's a quick, you can't argue with women. They just... It's like chasing a cat. Anyway, the um, we're going back to this. Taryn, are you single? Because I, I, I don't know that any of these guys should be taking advice from you if you're not married. <laughs> 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 we'll come back to that. Then he changes up. <laughs> anyway, now I'm just saying it's all the same. If you haven't figured it out, it's all about... Whatever you want, if you want liberty, you want a girlfriend, you want to earn a million dollars, it's all the same thing. You're creating desire, and you need to link it with fun and entertainment like Corey's talking about. The way this liberty movement's actually going to win is to make liberty cool. When it gets in the culture where every other show you're watching has some sort of liberty element in it, or it's one of the characters of the libertarian, whatever it is, you've won. Once it permeates, and it's getting bigger. There's way more Liberty messages in books and TV than it was 10 years ago. Uh, we have a question, and then they're trying to grab the mic from me like a monkey. Yeah, here. Give me that thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it's kind of a comment, and I wanted to challenge. At the very beginning, Corey said that he felt like we're slipping backwards, the Liberty movement. And I know that Corey doesn't live around here, and I, um, we moved up to New Hampshire you know, last year, right after, uh, about a month after Corpus ended. And, you know, they, they always say that in the beginning they ignore you, and then they acknowledge you, and then they start fighting you, and that's when you've won. And I'm not saying that we've won because we've got a lot of work to do, but here in New Hampshire, they are fighting us tooth and nail. Um, just somebody running for a local school board election, it got really nasty, dirty. Um, Aaron Day and Matt Phillips, there were all kinds of rumors being thrown at them because uh, Matt was uh, uh, renting their in-law apartment and, you know, all kinds of things. And there's a whole, there's a website that's dedicated just to New ha outing New Hampshire political libertarians and, and stuff like that. So my perception is very much different. But we could lose, we could slip backwards, and the way they do it is they always try to divide you. Yeah. And you know, and to focus on the negative or what, what they perceive to be negative and to 
slot us all as being that. They literally called us an armed insurgency looking to colonize New Hampshire, which may or may not be accurate so much, but, you know, but, uh, because we all It's kind of true, though. I mean... Yeah, I mean, well, no. I mean, we just want the right to have our firearms. Some of us are not armed. Yeah, I know. Not me, but, you know. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, there you go. that's exactly it, and that, that learn from your enemies. Oh, the Democrats are amazing. There's actually been, um, there's actually been, if you're really into psychology and stuff like that, there's been some university that run studies on the psychological manipulation that the Obama campaign did back in 08. It's fascinating stuff. It comes down to the most minute things you wouldn't even think of. The red and the Obama logo, the gradients they used. I mean, there is some excellent work. I mean, you can't get into this. I don't know enough about to even talk about it. But there is some excellent work when it comes to that kind of stuff. You can really use very tiny things to manipulate people to do things. Right, and that's what they do, and they use it to try to divide us. And what we need to focus on is what brings us together. Um, you know, freedom to choose. Freedom so to you need to s figure out your mission is to sit down and figure out how to spin that in with an emotional slant. How are you going to... Get that idea. Okay, something that will bring the liberty community together. Make it so it is seductive and sellable. What what do I have over here in the liberty community that would make me change my mind and come over there? If you guys can figure that question out, how to hammer the emotional, because we were talking about earlier, politicians are the king of this, man. People get elected completely on emotion, completely on bullshit claims that they're going to do stuff in some sort of vague comments of hope. Hope for what? You know, like, if we don't do that in the libertarian community, we're like, logic, come to us, we're smart. Our position is logical. No, you've got to hammer the emotion. Here in a second, Brian. Um, and that, that's actually, I want to make another point with that, and I didn't really want to get too involved in the actual movement because I don't want to make enemies, but I feel like this talk might already be doing that anyway. Um, there is a certain group in New Hampshire who is notorious for doing some activism that uh, is not very uh, well received by the community. And that saying is true, that saying by Gandhi is definitely true, but you have to wonder, is this resistance because of your ideas or the way you're going about your activism? Those are two totally different things. Um, are people going after you because they reject your ideas? Some of it probably certainly. Um, the political elite are not happy about the libertarians that are moving into New Hampshire. But, you know, that movement, that certain movement that shall uh, rena uh, remain unnamed, also has a movement against it made up of a lot of community members who are just very upset with the antics of the activist community. And it comes back to what we're talking about. If your activism is pissing people off to the point where you've got counter movements just solely based upon the crap you're pulling, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's that goes along with the whole Gandhi saying they're not fighting you, yeah, uh, simply based yeah, upon those your ideas. Aren't very large. They are. They are a few people, a handful of people who are very vocal. But because it's something that's important to us, we tend to really focus on it. But that kind of, I, I agree with what yeah. you're saying. You know, but and they you, do what they do. You know who's going to win though? Whoever makes it more emotional. It, 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 guys, it's all about emotion. Those people are way more emotional and pissed off, so they're getting a lot more attention. Oh my god, the free keeners are coming, destroying our way of life. They're going to change everything so your kids can't have a co education. They're going to steal your school. You know, they create fear. Fear is huge. You talk about the whole, uh, you want to see self-sufficiency, like the guys that are in the survival movement. The ones that are maybe the richest are the ones that push the fear button every day. Every talk show host that's out there that's making a lot of money, Rush Limbaugh, fear button, fear button, fear button, fear button. You could use the same thing for the Liberty Movement if you want. You can be like, you know, you're left with A and B and create something that if you don't go libertarian, this is what's going to happen. You can use fear button and drive it, but I think it's, it's kind of manipulative. I think you'd do much better with presenting this is happy land, utopia, feel good, look what we have, we're like people on drugs over here, you know. If you create that happy element, you got this, man. And so we just need to sit around and figure out an emotional. Because, you know what? Emotional advertising is being used on you every day and against you in every single campaign. Everything. The, the Democrats and the Republicans have no problem pushing this button at all. But for some reason, we're still arguing, arguing logic over here, man.
and, and what Aaron said about fear being huge is absolutely correct. And I'll just say in general terms, when you're doing any sort of activism or outreach in the name of liberty, don't do it to where if you see a YouTube video, the average Joe on the street's going to be scared of you. Think that you're some sort of a weirdo whack job, even if we you can have the best intent in the world. And I, and I really think all the activists have great intentions. And I agree with all of their intent. I, I, I know what the final outcome and the push of their message is. But does Joe Q Public watching it on YouTube know that? Absolutely not. Joe Q Public is going to be reactionary to that and say, Oh my goodness, they're assaulting an old lady. They're you know violating an old lady's privacy. And you can sit, and Derek J did a great job yesterday, and after he explained what had happened in one recent scenario, made perfect sense to me. I understand exactly what he's saying now. But upon just viewing it, it doesn't quite look like that. So you have to really have, like anything, you've really got to have an outline of what you're doing. It has to be explained. People can be dumb. The general public can be very, very uh, dumb. No I know shit. I can be dumb. It's why if I watch a Wendy's commercial at 2 in the morning, I start crying that there's no freaking Wendy's in my town because suddenly I'm hungry for Wendy's. And it's the same sort of thing. It, it, it's marketing the right way. It's bringing that message the right way. If you just see this imagery, ah, well, tell them why it's being done at least. At least package it in a way that's presentable to the average guy on the street. Yeah, you know, as a movement, we really need more PR people. Um, if you're going into, uh, if you are young and you want to go into a, a career, marketing and PR, that is the two things that we are very deficient in. Um, and I think that would help us a lot. It would be nice to have some sort of consulting that the activists can go to before coming up with strategy. I feel like a lot of what the activists do is just like, oh, I've got this really good idea, let's go out. They don't sit down and think about the implications of it or what the repercussions of the activism could be. They just go out and do it. I mean, it's activism, it's action, that's fantastic. But I mean, there's movements that have succeeded and there's movements that have failed in this country. Um, a, a movement that you could look upon as a very successful movement that used PR very well was the Civil Rights Movement and Martin Luther King and, and the letter for Birmingham Jail and some of the things that they did, um, it was just incredibly effective to get the media interested and that was the thing, they used emotion. I mean, you didn't have to see Malcolm on TV, I mean, they're out there toting guns, fantastic, uh, they could have taken stuff back too and it could have been a hell of a lot more violent. But you had Malcolm on TV making these power, or Mar uh, Martin on TV making all these powerful speeches and just making people very emotional, emotional, oh my god, these, and it made these white liberals, I mean, let's be realistic, it made these white liberals, like, feel so bad. You think that they had the money in their economy, the black community, to fund this stuff? Yeah. It was a bunch of white Jews from New York that was funneling money into the NAACP and SNCC, and it was because of these tactics that make them feel guilty. Now, we could talk about white guilt all day long, and I don't want to get into it, but it was a very effective way to get civil, the civil rights movement going, and that's another strategy we could use. You can use guilt. Make people feel bad. Oh, you're paying your taxes. Do you realize that, that your tax money goes towards killing people? Um, maybe not that strong out of the gate, but it de something like that could definitely work. I, I've used that argument on friends of mine, and even though it didn't necessarily change their mind completely, they were silenced. I mean, they, they hadn't thought of it that way. So I knew full well that they were going to go home then and say, you know what, Hagen's not just a crazy libertarian. I mean, he is. But maybe there is actually something to that crazy message. And if you want to actually get your point across, the way you do it is, you know, they might be saying, you're, some guy's complaining at work about taxes, and you say, you know, what kind of program would you eliminate? What do you think's a waste of money? Does it infuriate you that they take your money to use this? Let them tell you what pisses them off. Because as a libertarian, you're going to agree with whatever it is. Right. You know? <laughs> oh, I can't stand homeless. I can't stand the welfare. I can't stand the war. I can't stand whatever, corporatism. And then you just roll with that idea. And you go, you know, you're damn right. That corporatism pisses me off. What the hell does McDonald's need $200 million for? You know, whatever it is. 
and you agree on that point and you roll with them on that point and then you're like in there you can shift it to you what you want and you just got to be subtle if you come right out swinging like Corey does there's a good chance you're going to knock someone in the face of you know it, like he said you don't come out with it that's that's but if you want to say you know the anti-war message you can be like i you know i heard all this we talked about corporatism we talked about whatever you know you don't want to pay for welfares or whatever your button is but i was struggling with this myself that you know i really watch the news and i'm getting real sad about all this collateral damage that these little babies accidentally getting killed and knowing my top my tax dollars paid for it made me feel like crap and i feel really guilty you bring it to you you don't tell them how you feel i feel guilty because they're using my money and you shut the hell up and let them talk and they'll be like oh yeah i kind of feel bad about that too i wish there was a way if you you, you, you just guys see the difference i'm talking about how i feel in myself relating to a very similar thing they're talking about they bring up a point and then i talk about how i feel you don't tell them how they feel and oh my god don't do that to a woman <laughs> hey we have a question in the back go ahead yeah i, I tried once to use the, the guilty argument and uh, it was turned on to me that if, let's say it wasn't a bad uh, a bad uh, um, thug but just a regular thug that uh, went to your house and brought a uh, went uh, run away with your money would you feel responsible with their actions so if you're not responsible for someone stealing from your house money x why you feel why would you feel guilty when the government steals from you and does x well and that that's really a logical argument though i mean it has an element of guilt into it but I mean, you've really just got to make them feel bad. I mean, really. I mean, if you want to use guilt, make them feel bad about themselves. You could do that, or you could do Terrence. I think it could work either way. Now, the reason you might not want to make them feel bad about themselves is they might want, not want to talk it's, to you. It just really depends on the person. Like crushing right off the yeah. Bat. You, you throw that puppy in their lap, and they're like, holy crap, I just kid. You know, I just... It, you've got to be subtle, man. Because if you just drop that puppy in their, their lap of, like Corey's saying, well, you know, you... Your tax fund goes to drone weddings. Um, yes, it's true, but you can't throw that in their lap because some people cannot process that. You have to be a lot subtler of what program would you think is a waste of money? Really? I kind of feel that way. You know what bothered me is this program. Man, I heard about this drone strike at this wedding, and I was just horribly upset. I mean, how wrong is that to, whatever, murder 20 little kids to get one bad guy? And then you could just sit back. And then they'll, you know, listen to the, what they respond. Guys, go subtle, man. It's again, it's like our creepitarian talk earlier. You can't, you can't just go right in at someone. <laughs> and and posting those pictures on your Facebook page does you no favor either with your everyday friends. I mean, if you post a news article about, you know, a drone strike or the flash banged baby, if you post a news article, that's fine. But when you go posting just like the picture of the. Di that's not going to win anybody, including myself. Even preaching the choir, I'm, I don't want to be seeing those pictures. I, I, it, I've got a very squeamish stomach, and that sort of thing makes me sick. So even I, if I'm getting turned off, imagine what the guy who has no context of what you're posting about is thinking. Uh, sir, with the guy bullets shirt on, you had a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say to his comment earlier, Technically, I would say they're still responsible because they were dumb enough to not have a good enough home security system. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah again, yeah, but you're not going to win that argument. Yeah. You're no, you're not. You're stupid. Why didn't you buy it? Yeah, you, you know, that's the thing. You don't want people to feel... In, the way to say that, no, no, no. The way to say that is... How would we say this, guys? What have we learned so far? You know, man, I, that has to be horrible what happened to you. I remember when my brother got broken into and he lost everything and he just kicked himself in the ass for not having a security system. You understand? Different it's that stuff. simple. You're an idiot. It's, you it's that simple. You don't want people, we say it, I mean, we think the general public is dumb and that's a big thing. I, I, I don't think they're dumb. I, I honestly don't. I think, I think a good majority of the public is intelligent in their own way. We're just intelligent when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, but what they are is, I would call it more ignorant. And you don't want to put people down. Even if they're the stupidest person on the planet, they don't want to think like they're dumb. They think that they're the most intelligent person that's ever lived. Uh, you want to boost egos. You want them to make them feel like they're special. 
like the Mr. Rogers. Why do you think Mr. Rogers was so special or so <coughs> successful? He came, he left every show. You are you're so special. You're so special to me, Taryn. I say it all the time. Yeah. You're so special, Corey. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. We're doing a lot of story talking. Mm -hmm. for, yeah. Political reasons. Um, I always wanted some special interest. Wonder Woman Notch, I was a teacher. She wanted more funding for the schools. Other guy was a lawyer. He wanted funding for the court systems. Other than just hitting next door and saying, screw it. I, I have no idea how you can uh, talk to this I get it. first. Yeah. My first job, probably the most important job I ever had in my life, door-to-door -door sales. When I was 10 years old, I used to sell newspaper subscriptions. And I took what I learned from that job, and those lessons you learn at 10 actually were probably the best business lessons I ever had. Going door-to-door -door really teaches you how to sell. What you would say in that situation is instead of, um, you want to find the topic that crosses over to liberty that's important to them. So they might be like, yeah, I want funding for cops, roads, police, whatever. But I really want to get rid of X. Oh, we want to get rid of X too. Blah, 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 blah. What else would you like to get rid of? Oh, well, I'd like to get rid of, you know, um, welfare. We'd like to get rid of welfare too. Blah, 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 blah. So you stay on what you agree with. Just for door-to-door -door sales, you need to, to find out what's important to them and hammer it. Find out what's important to them and hammer it. Don't argue with them about the other stuff and ignore it. That's the wrong time to, to, to debate. And you're in the you're in a, not a power position. You're standing in front of their doorstep. They just chunk. Yeah, and I, I maybe Taryn will disagree with me, but the other way you could do that, I'd say that's probably the best way to do it. But if you have a convincing counter-argument, that's not an argument. You can't frame it as an argument. You can't be like, no, screw you, you're wrong. But if you're like, well, yeah, I, I believe that too. I think a school should be funded. That's fantastic. But uh, have you heard about this? You know, this, these, these home, like he said, the homeschool kids. Have you heard about this? I mean, you could do something like that. I mean, of course, you'd have to be prepared to go into a situation and kind of have your counterpoints there. But you don't want to argue with people. Have a conversation. Uh, and engage. Engage is the most important thing. You want to draw people into what you're saying as much as possible. Spread out your words like this, maybe not as dramatic, but <laughs> you want them to look at you. Use hand gestures, use things like this, but you want people to focus on you and listen to every single word that you're saying. This is almost in anything in life, we talk too much. And I mean, yes, we're on stage, so we're talking too much. But normally, you want to ask this person one question and then shut the hell up and let them talk and then wait for an opening and steer it where you want it to go. You understand? You're gonna, uh, the person, if you're going to 10-minute conversation and 9 minutes they're talking, they're going to think that's the best conversation they ever had. And all you're doing is it's like you're being a therapist. You're just redirecting questions. I, oh, I want you to take away this, blah, 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 blah. Oh, what else would you like to take away? Oh, this, blah, 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 blah. What else would you like to take away? Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, you should check out this literature. Boom, you're done. That's it. Yeah, and that was like one of the, you know, my dad taught me a few things, and that was one of the biggest things he taught me. Uh, and that's why people who, people who people really like learn this really early in life. When you talk to somebody, just like Terrence said, you, you don't want to be the one doing the talking. You can interject here and there and steer it, like he said, but ask them questions about themselves and it works really well in romantic relationships now don't be boring now if you now if you really want to know if a girl uh, is not your type if she answers the yes or no questions then you should probably end the date but draw out those questions it works really well in radio it works really well in a lot of different contexts sales especially you want them to sell themselves on your product and sell them on let them sell themselves on liberty they're they're going to have things wrapping up through their mind yeah, I mean, that, that really is always the key, is turning it back on them. Letting them answer their own questions a lot of the time is the best thing that you can do. When you're conducting an interview, Taryn and I do the most important radio show called the Liberty Cats every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on Daily Ball Radio. Corey and I do probably the most intelligent radio show on the air, and it's called the Corey Moore Show, Friday nights, 10 o'clock p.m., and the fact of the matter is when we interview a lot of people, and, and, and really the, the greatest thing about that is listening. The key to a good interview is listening. And I hear a lot of 
We have a lot of radio shows out there in Liberty <coughs> Land, I'll tell you that. And you can tell there's not a lot of listening. There's, a, there's this idea that you pick up a microphone and you just start talking. And then sometimes your girlfriend screams at you in the middle of the show. Oh, yeah. And making it entertaining. You know, Cody and Melinda are sitting there. They, make, they do a very entertaining show. And that's really it, is entertaining people and listening to them. I think those are two of the two biggest things that we need to do more of. I've always said, being a mainstream radio guy, and, and I've, I've served in a lot of status positions in my life. You know, I've been on a park board, I've been on a library board, and I've had a lot of make, a, make a lot of presentations before city councils. And the beautiful thing about that is, I always said, if, if you want something from them, Go in and do a little song and dance, you know, play the nut cup game with them, entertain them a little bit, nuts over here, you know, and then boom, you're gone. They decide in your favor because they like you. It's like performing on American Idol. They're the judges. So when you're trying to get that political activism out there and you have to go before a city council, don't go in and say, with the thunder and power of Murray Rothbard and the gold standard, no, go in and say, hey, how you doing, council members? This is great. You know, hey, commend you on the fountain downtown. Looks good. The cleanup was good down there. Now, hey, let's discuss this. And if you entertain them a little bit, you're probably even going to be able to win that argument in the end. Well, keep hammering it all day long. Find the common ground you guys have. Yes. Like, there's, even with the local politicians, they want to get rid of something. Yes. We always want to get rid of something, right? And that's it. And oh yeah, I totally agree with that point. You know what? That's why we're doing that. We need to get rid of this. Maybe we can love them together. Yeah. You know, and and it sounds like manipulative and smarmy sometimes. Sales is a little sometimes. Yeah. But it's the it's the human psyche. Wow. And if you want to sell liberty, you've got to treat it that way. By the way, Erica and Nicole, best dress ever. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> love my cat. She wore that for us. Did you guys know that Liberty Cats? There you go. Um, I had to point that out. So. That's that's what I'd say with with you guys, right? That if you get one thing out of the speech, the whole thing, what is it going to be, guys? Make it. Thank you. In every aspect of life, people don't make decisions on logic, and libertarians are living in logic land. We love logic. We cuddle with logic. We talk about logic. Oh my God, if I could just be a little more logical, they'll get it and come to my side. No. They have to be led emotionally first. Even the ones that are living in logic land will not make that decision until it's emotional form. So every time you want to win an argument or want to convert someone to your side or sell something or date someone, you have to sit down and say, how can I use, what's their emotional trigger? There's three parts to telling, uh, deciding what's an important news story. And it's heart, health, and pocketbook. And I think it's the exact same way with activism and selling us. How does this affect your heart? How does liberty affect your health, your well-being, your, your, your personage? And how does it affect your pocketbook? And if you find common ground in those three areas, you're probably going to have something to talk about. And again, don't think you're going to win a convert in a day, a week, or maybe even a year. But if that one person then spreads one little idea that they talk to you about to someone else, that person then spreads a different idea with someone else and at least there's liberty discussion and you've got a stronger foundation out there for when you're out there, you know, making those, I don't want to say arguments, but when you're making that push for why we believe what we believe to be the right way. Corey. Yeah, and I, I want to, you know, you guys said argument and you kind of backed away from yeah. it. Um, here's a life tip. Never argue with anyone ever, ever. If you think you're going to get into an argument, stop it. Don't argue. It never accomplishes anything. You will never win. Ever. Because people don't like to be told they're wrong. I have to bring that point up again. And I guess the last point, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, I'm uh, assuming we're wrapping up with this pretty soon. Is you need to live, five minutes, you need to live as best life as you possibly can. It comes back to what I was talking about, lifestyle libertarianism. You could be the most fantastic person in the world, uh, but if you if people find out that you're a bum and you're living under a bridge, and you're broke and uh, nobody takes you seriously outside of the movement, then I I don't see like you going to your local Walmart and talking to somebody. I don't see how that's going to accomplish anything. So learn get your financial house in order, learn how to talk to people, and stop being a bum. Yeah, you know, I remember Malcolm X said, and I've always loved Malcolm X. You know, he, he told so many 
in that time period. He said, you know, if you want to look like thugs, fine, dress like thugs. If you want to be taken seriously, dress to be taken seriously. That's the other thing we can do. You know, we can walk around with wacky posters or whatever, but when you're in those, you know, there's a time for everything. But when you're really trying to get your message taken serious, dress and act the same way that those serious people that have to hear your message are dressing and acting. Yeah, you're only going to attract the kind of people that you dress as well as. And I know that's hard to hear, but it's the truth. If you want money people, you got to dress like money people. If you want activists, you dress like, you know, unemployed, pot-smoking activists. And that's the way we go. So, I'm going to hit this last point, and this is true again. So, so true. And it's a very famous saying. You can either be, uh, when we're having a conversation, is it more important to be right or more important to be happy? They're not the same thing. And a lot of times you will be right on a very important moral issue. And to bring that person over, you just kind of have to set that aside, come back to it later, and keep working on their emotional until they come over. Don't head them face on and argue. Corey's absolutely right. Arguing is total waste. Do we understand that? Yay? 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 Do we get something out of this? Please make sure you drop a lot of money in the Jack's Bowl. If you don't, Karma will bite you in the ass.